I know you guys are excited for this video. I've been having it for a very long time. It's finally here. Let's rank every Netflix show. So Netflix has had its ups and downs, hasn't it? It seems like the savior of TV ended up killing it, before killing the streaming as well. Sad, since originals are usually pretty great. Two other animation divisions are completely ignored, both by the general public and themselves. But Netflix has tons and tons, like so many freaking tons of shows. Like, it's been only just starting off a decade ago. They have easily way more shows than the three networks I already covered already combined. Despite them all being around 30 years old, it came the problem that there were so many shows I wanted to discuss that I got cucked out of the top 35. So I decided that since most of the shows here only lasted a season or two, I'll pop it all the way up to top 50. That's still a lot of shows though, so I'm limited to only shows produced by Netflix. That means all of these shows on screen, alongside a few others, are not eligible. I also remove any shows that didn't fully air on Netflix, which means that at this point, three out of four of these big network watch-throughs have cut Clone Wars out of the ranking. That's hilarious. Oh, whenever I bring up that I'm making this video, uh, I always get one question and that's big mouth. But the other thing I get is, oh god, does that mean you gotta watch all the live action shows and the preschool shows and the random shows they happen to acquire in the movies and- No. I don't need to do that. I have never done that. Did you all watch some secret cut of the CN video where I discussed Destroy, Build, Destroy? The alternate version of the Nick video where I revealed my number one was actually Dora. The only fan exclusive version of the Disney video where I threw Zombies 2 at the top? No. There's always been the main core animated shows, and that's what we're sticking with. That's still a lot of shows. So much are in contention to be the greatest animated show of all time. And the other is the elephant in the room and I'm trying my hardest to avoid. So sit back and chill. Not in that way, I'll cut you like a fishy. This is me ranking my top 50 favorite animated Netflix shows. Voltron Legendary Defender. Oh boy, here we go. So this is a spicy meatball to start with. You can I don't know. The finale of this show completely killed the fan base. Like, that was all the way back in 2018. And I'm not exaggerating, I have not heard a single soul say like the show since. I've seen people defend Star Versus after its disastrous finale, but this, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Going into it, I really know nothing about it besides that, that it's finale really sucked. The positive feelings for the early seasons were heavily buried. As for what I think, it was okay, I guess. Yeah, I didn't have super high feelings for most of the show. I do like the characters, and the action is mostly good. But I don't know, it never fully clicked with me. When later seasons happened, I didn't even feel betrayed. It was just kind of a sloppy version of the early seasons. The stuff I like is enough to carry it to just barely make it here. And by stuff I like, I mean one thing. I really, really like Pidge. What? Stripe likes a structurally awkward, nerdy green girl whose heavily head cat is autistic and ace? What? No! Yeah, Pidge basically made in a way after me to like her. When she's on screen, I'm locked in. My love of this scrimble is enough to boost the show here. I will say though, I've never seen a show hate its main premise more than this one. Yeah, you know, Voltron, giant robot mecha thing. Would be super cool to see that. I am not exaggerating, Voltron appears like once or twice a season. If you want to make a show with more focused on humans, why in God's green earth would you adapt the Mecha show? It's cool when we see it, but yeah, I kind of want more Voltron in my Voltron. Oh, and I guess I gotta address the ending. Yeah, the whole thing is messy, but it features a pileup of every dumb character ruining idea of the final season was colliding into one. Most obviously is the five second reveal of Shiro being gay. A reveal is so rushed that from that point on, Western animation never includes same sex male couples as main characters ever again. I'm sure this is they thought it would have been like Bubbleine or Korosami. But those ships allowed us to see them bond before the big reveal in the finale. We've never met this two before. I can go on, but the horse has been beaten so badly, I don't think it qualifies as a horse anymore. Its legacy may not be worth defending, but it has Pidge, so I like it kind of. A Gritsko. So I know this show is really popular, so I feel bad for putting it so low, but, well, the show is aimed at two types of people. Middle-aged woman in a crummy office job who just wants to be seen, and furries. You can tell I'm definitely not the first one. The second one is questionable. Also, the main joke is cute character screams death metal, which is funny exactly once, but it's a once per episode thing. I think it's sale real fast. With that said, I like the various dynamic the office staff has. Every character seems really flat, but I like in a mini arc to show that they're more than meets the eye Transformers. Just seeing these guys interact is fun, and that can carry through the death metal that just drags the plot to a halt. Also, of course, it's done by Senrio of Hell Kitty fame. Again, cute things, things death metal lose all the time quickly. But they're trying to put designs to help me at least remember them all. Well, not as into the devil music! I guess that was a screaming good time. Kulapari and Army of Frogs. Guys, I gotta level with you. I really like frogs. 
That's what carries a show here. I just like seeing the hoppy stuffy boys just frogging the frick out. I love that it just throws you head first. This is the world of giant animals, the different factions, the scorpions are evil, fun times. Oh, and Leader of the Scorpions is watched by Keith David. Scrooge is all in agreement that a frog shot a cat or something. There's another reason why he's typecasted as a villain in the frog media. This is the first of many shows that was very short lived, but hey, I really like frogs. Dead End Paranormal Park. Another show that's very split on what it wants to be. I appreciate both parts, but I think they could have been handled better. On one hand, the actual park is pretty fun. There's a lot of unique creatures and fun stuff they do with it. Men 4 are all fun characters in their own way, and I like the really bright shading contrasting with the very red and purple color scheme. The other thing is it's a very inclusive show. The main character is, as far as I know, is one of the only male trans leads in children's animation. Well, one of two. I expressed Norma's autism at the start of this year. The problem is they really don't balance these well. There's a lot of time with supernatural park stuff that just appears for the characters just kind of monologue. Granted, in the world we live in, being as blatant as you can with rep is important. But it happens so frequently, it does kind of drag on the story. The show had its plug pulled before it could really go all the way. Don't act shocked. Maybe in the alternate universe, the show would be more balanced. But for now, Dead End is a very wide open show that I recommend, if you know what you're getting into. Hey. The Adventures of Puss in Boots. During the mid 2010s, Netflix did a lot of series with DreamWorks, with this being the first we'll discuss. Making the first Shrek show a Puss one is certainly a choice, especially when this has nothing to do with the movie. Like, it takes place in the same town as the first Puss film, but that's it. No other characters from that film appear. Like, we just replaced Kitty with a different female cat. I, I, I don't get it. This show is a lot of fun, though. I spent a bit on the Puss lore. While a lot of DreamWorks shows tend to kind of figure out the personality of the main character, this is still Puss. He's still loudmouthed, showy, yet good hearted swordsman we all know from the movies. Animation is a downgrade, but they do introduce a lot of cool looking characters. There have been a ton of different myths that were in the movies. It's weird that watching this now that we have Last Wish, because, like, they introduce a big gray wolf guy that embodies the trade darkness and puts it to do with multiple lives. Why wasn't the annoying pig in Last Wish? He would have murdered Jack Horner. I'm sure I'll make a big Shrek video later while I'll discuss this deeper. But for now, yeah, I like it. It's epic. I have 45 more shows. Oh dear God. <laughs> Cosmic. If you're new here, hi. But also, you probably don't remember my video where I covered everything I saw in 2021. I claim this was my favorite cartoon I saw that year. With a claim like that, you might be shocked at how low this got. But as the years go by, I'm really conflicted with this series. The good first. The animation is fantastic. It nailed the old comic aesthetic perfectly. The characters are also great. Kiss Hot Head in this, Chuck Learning to be a hero, Papa G being a silly guy, Cat. First two seasons tell a really good story. The first of Kid trying to understand these power rings and how to get over the trauma of his parents' death, and the second expanding the world a bit and introducing a new villain. Literally just fan out, like, like this is borderline copyright infringement. I love the first two seasons. Season 3 lost me. I kept building up a super obvious big twist, like Wowie Zowie, there might be another power ring. They're really putting a lot of emphasis on G's necklace. I wonder if they're connected. Making Herodias go from this big cosmic entity with no real drive besides destruction to having a sad backstory is okay in theory. But in execution, it comes out of nowhere. It really just tuna sandwich monologuing to us for a full minute. I like that the show acknowledges in season one, this is not a team you want to save you. A kid, a toddler, a cat, an old dude, and a waitress. All with no combat experience. But it's just nice people helping solve your local threats. Bringing a planet destroyer kind of ruins that. Papa G relapses back to constantly lying, because despite that being his arc in season one, it really feels like season three crumbled the finish line. I still know the first two seasons are enough to boost it here, but no amount of power rings can save us. City of Ghosts. Here's a short one. City of Ghosts is a mockumentary style show looking at the more realistic and diverse parts of Los Angeles. The characters have a simplistic yet cute blocky look, and they're all done in CG against painted backgrounds over the locations. It's only six episodes, but it's cute, you should watch it. Way of the House Husband. Oh hey, speaking of short shows, Way of the House Husband is hilarious. It follows Tatsu, a feared Yakuza member, who retires from his life of crime to being a loving house husband. Oh, with a wacky chicanery that comes from it. The show vibes so hard, man. All the stupid stuff Tatsu does is great. He even does the most simplistic things in the most intense ways. And I watch The Lion King. Dude, I love The Lion King. I just wish it was longer than it was. Heck, every episode is only 15 minutes. It consists of individual shorts. Still, it's my baby girl. So I love. Centaur World. Another show I'm very mixed on. I remember seeing this post saying this show was impossible to recommend because it's half fart jokes and half a giant list of trigger warnings. And yeah, that's the show. The stuff with the writer going through this war that solely is revealed to be more than an average war, that's great. The stuff with the centaurs in this weird trippy world, that's, I don't know. The world is intriguing and deep. 
But God, I want to kill these guys. Most of the cast is super annoying. Then the giant slime monster of death comes in and stuff becomes awesome. How would a show this lighthearted then suddenly have this giant evil skeleton creature of death? Again. Also, the stands alongside Phoenix and Fur Band, Donkey Kong, as a rare musical show. The songs are all fairly solid. The one from Nowhere King is the best. Again, I can't quite say I love this show, since it's so up and down, but it's like a centaur itself. The show is an ungodly fusion of two tones. But I do at least say give it a watch once. Pacific Rim the Black. Here's a fun fact. I've never seen the Pacific Rim movies. I know the first one is said to be a lot of fun, the second is seemingly the worst show of all time, on the count of every single person I've ever discussed it with. But the anime is fairly distinct from it. The anime is less about Kaiju versus Mecha like the film is, and instead about two siblings adapting a boy who can turn into literally just a gremlin and try to protect him from all of the things in the world that want to kill him. This takes place in Australia. Why do people worry about the Kaiju? I feel like the natural wildlife is dangerous enough. Well, you do get your Kaiju fights, and they are great. It's surprisingly more character focused. A lot of screen time goes to the siblings, their commander, and the boy they're found. Very cleverly named... Boy. All four have a fun dynamic that can carry your, your interest for just long enough for Godzilla appears. Not sure if I like this more or less than I saw the movies, but I can't confirm. Pacific Rim the Black is not the worst kaiju combat since Pacific Rim 2. It's really solid. Stretch Armstrong and Stretch Force. Do you miss cheesy 90s and 2000s animated action comedies? Do I got a show for you? Stretch Armstrong, yes, based off that toy, Spendle did not like it, is what do you want from an action cartoon? Characters with wacky over the top power and personalities, a very light story to tie everything together, some matter between the main characters, and Napoleon Dynamite as the main villain. If the art style looks familiar, because it was made by the same mind behind Spectacular Spider Man, included a lot of the same staff. And while it's nowhere near a masterpiece of that show, it's still a fun time. It's silly, it's over the top, but ain't a stretch to say it's a ton of fun. Carmen San Diego. San Diego. Carmen San Diego is a good show. Oh, I should probably say something more about it. Uh, Carmen San Diego is a really good show. Yeah, I got nothing. Look, man, I like this show, but there's not much to say about it. It's admittedly pretty formulaic, as every episode mostly goes down to Carmen going to a place, finding a villain, and some artifact. But the animation is absolutely stunning. I love the look of this show. But again, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know what about this show shuts my brain off, but it, it does, I guess. G good show, watch it. Love, Death, and Robots. This Insolidary series started as one of Netflix's most praised shows, then immediately dipped in popularity by the time season two came out for some reason. As an Insolidary that's very loosely related to each other, the only connection between them all is that it involves love, death, and or robots. I guess it makes sense. You can definitely be interested in some shorts, but not others. It's a bit hard to discuss this one since, like, nothing's very consistent. Some shorts are super dark and depressing, full of death and bleakness. Blows of Yogurt eradicates the global economy in six months, with only safe place being Ohio. It definitely got its ups and downs, but if you stomach a whole lot of death, you'll love it. Robots. Turbo Fast. The reason this Turbo film is really, really bad. Fast Snail. That's it. That, that's all there is to it. It's not like Ratatouille or Kung Fu Panda, where they build in that. No, this film is just meanders at, ironically, a snail's pace. Also, racism. So why does the show go as hard as it does? Turbo Fast focuses much harder on the snail gang, and the town they have. And, like, Banger? They meet all these weird characters who all want to beat Turbo in a race. The one-note member of the gang are actually really funny somehow. And the animation. My god, the animation is beautiful. It really helps sell the fast-paced action dynamic races all the better. Also, like... It's genuinely really funny. I only have fed Turbo for reasons outside of ironic memes. Something, something race over the show or something. I don't care. My order of Halo Ranch should be here soon. <laughs> Cannon Busters. Pretty simple one here. Cannon Busters is a crowdfunded anime based on a comic that's merely a bit cliched. Actually, no, a lot cliched. It's the most anime anime of all time. But, uh, I like it. I like the blend of samurai and high tech the world has. And the main tree are all fun in their own right. Also, the action, the action's cool. Yeah, guys, I'm sorry. I know this video isn't as scripted. I'm saving all my analysis for the Big Mouse segment. Super Crooks. Okay, so Jupiter's Legacy was a 2013 comic book that inspired a live action movie with the same name in 2021. And then a few months later, it got an anime that really has nothing to do with it. You caught up? No? To the eradication station with you. I just vibe with this premise. A small town crook hires a bunch of supervillains to help them arrive early. It's like a Suicide Squad was good. Well, I guess that's a sequel, but shut up. 
Basically, Matrix of Boys was anime. I really like the animation here. It almost looks like you're scanning anime, but suddenly at points it gets really sketchy, really dynamic. I really don't remember the characters super well, but I thought it was a fun time. Also, this is apparently getting a live action series. It's a live action TV series about an anime that's a spin off of a movie that's adapting a comic. She'd fight out of the movie, the game would be so proud. Zom 100, Bucket List of the Dead. I wasn't really looking forward to this one, honestly. Even a decade after the zombie boom of the early 2010s, I'm really tired of zombies. That's where the show stands out. Yes, it's a zombie show, but it's like, positive? That's weird to me, honestly. The zombie stuff is super depressing and bleak. But while this has the normal zombie stuff of death and sadness and gang leaders and kidnappers and oh god, why are people sad? Zombies just want to have a little afternoon snack. My god, let them live, Susan! The link here to Akira Tendo decides that before he never dives, he's going to live. He wants to do everything he couldn't do during the time of Sailor Man during the apocalypse. Living life to its fullest. It has a very strong message. That being that the zombie apocalypse isn't as bad as working a marketing firm. It's just a really refreshing take on zombies, and I really enjoyed my time with it. I just wish it was longer, hence why I couldn't make it higher. Still, it's a really great series. Cross it off your bucket list very soon. <laughs> Glitch Text. For my top 35 Nickelodeon shows video. I'm famous and lazy. There's 50 shows here. Legends Quest. I knew the show for a while. All I knew about it was that it was a Mexican produced series. I knew it was an adventure series where the main crew meets a bunch of mythological creatures, but soon it was only Mexican mythology. No, they go all across the world and meet all kinds of creatures. It's really cool. And their style is beautiful. The main four bounce off each other really well. It's a fantastic little series. And I'm so glad it got a season two. The problem is. Uh. Well, you can tell what the problem is, right? I'm sending you to Brazil. It's still a good show. The rating is the same. The animation is not bad. It's good, in fact. It's just a notable downgrade. We still got the fun mythological stuff and character dynamic. So yeah, thank it. Troll forever. I freaking hate people, man. Okay, if you're vaguely aware of the show, it's because of the controversy with its creator. Right before the show dropped, its creator was exposed to being a massive creep. So the show was quietly killed off. It's kind of like Clarence. So while that show had an opportunity to grow without its creator, this show was doomed to be forgotten. Which is so sad because now that its creator is completely detached from the show and watching it won't support her, this show does so much good, man. 12 Forever is about Reggie growing up and accepting the changes in her life, freeing new friends to giving up her childhood interest to puberty. Wow, a good Netflix show that covers puberty? What are the odds? This is portrayed by alternate realms she goes to, full of unique creatures and abilities. She has to go with her best friend, who's voiced by Pit Kadikaris. So yeah, the show was made for me. I wish the person who made it wasn't an awful person. And the main villain is the Butt Witch. She's voiced by Matt Berry. Again, I wish we had a second season. So I see more of the Butt Witch under the watch of someone who isn't an awful person. Pokemon Country Urge. Hey, have you ever had a bad day? Bullies picking on you, asking nothing before you can finish it. Console finally found your location and executed your family's collateral for the many, many crimes you've made as a criminal boss. Then watch Pokemon Country Urge. This is just pure, utter sweet dreams fuel. Full stop. The adorable stop motion, combined with the little detail on all puppets, like the fur of my little scrim blue fur. Pokemon has rolling disasters every week, but none of that is here. It's just a nice, relaxing resort of friendly people, and every Pokemon must be your friend. In fact, they are your friend. They've been your friend before you were born. The entire existence before this point was elaborate plan to become your friend. As a Pokemon fan, this just makes me happy. Again, it's as complex as Magikarp's move said, but I don't want complexity. I want Furret! And they gave me Furret! If your Netflix icon is Furret, you're just instantly my friend and I trust you. Before you ask, play our social security card. Castlevania. There's such a massive turnaround with this show, man. The Castlevania cartoon, yes, it's a cartoon, not an anime, was praised as the first great video game adaptation. But nowadays, it's a lot more divisive thanks to how differently it is from the games. Admittedly, though, I haven't played the games. All my knowledge of the games come from Smash Bros. and the funny line. With that said, I really like it. It really nails the gothic atmosphere. From what I know, the games aren't that bloody, but this doesn't hold back. And the action is brutal. Dracula is the wonderfully written character. It can be hard to balance a sympathetic character with a monstrously evil one, but I do greatly with him. Alucard is hot. Pacing is admittedly a horrific problem with the series. From the inconsistent tone to how they'll go from a streak of episodes with any real prevalence to the plot to the exact opposite of that sentence. It shapes just from Dracula himself, but it's a great show overall. Hotel Transylvania. Efforts for family. On the surface, this show should suck. A cartoon by a comedian with no animation experience. It's a sitcom with a family with a very stiff and OVR style. 
This should suck. Somehow though, it's actually great. And fairly flawed too, but the comedy sucks. I think every season has like one or two really good jokes. But every other one, I mean, they're not grown worthy, but they're not funny. Animation is really super stiff and not pleasant. It's a clear family art ripoff style. So why is there actual effort put into this? You can tell a lot of this comes from Bill Burr's actual life. That's just helped all the more emotional moments hit so much harder. The show is deconstruction of the typical nuclear family in 50s lifestyle, and it does that phenomenally. The show nails and comfortable atmosphere, but at the end of the day, it's showing the family does love each other. It's important because I feel like it tries too hard to be depressing. If something suddenly good happens to a character, you can always expect that it will be either undone or throw some other negative twist their way. And it's never subverted. It's definitely becoming a gut punch and just becoming predictable. Listen, this show is held together by toothpicks and bubblegum. But like, they chew in that gum so freaking tight. Just like family life, it's bumpy, but it's worth it. That's a joke, by the way. Not the show, the show is great. The family isn't worth it. The only other time I want people in my house is the meat in my freezer. Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. How did it take this long to get a Jurassic Park cartoon? It seems so obvious. We had to wait until 2020 to get it. Yes, yeah, tied to the World Trilogy, but unlike those, it's good. The first season introduces six kids who were part of a camp in the park. But right before they could start their activities, the Indominus Rex gets loose. So now they got to team up and navigate the park, move the dinosaur decides to have a light snack. For a kid's show, it's really intense. The scenes with the dinosaurs are all drowned out and always sensible. Generally, I never knew if one of the kids was going to die or not. All the kids are fairly distinct. My favorite, unsurprisingly, being the freaking loser. The later seasons are still good, but they haven't had the same intensity of the first. And yeah, the animation is fairly cheap TV CGI. But like, if you like the movies, you gotta check this out. Also check out the sequel series, Chaos the series. It's good too. I literally just finished it the day before writing this, since it's newer. Yeah, epic. He was a dinosaur killing guy. Skylanders and Imagination Academy. Skylanders is just a dumb, fun cartoon nonsense. I know the game is divisive because of the brutal killing of Spyro until he returned, but it's funny and I like it. Simply, it's about a group of new heroes led by Spyro trying to prove themselves. I only played a bit of the games, but they nail the humor and have tons of fun nods to the games. Chaos is still the voice of Richard Horowitz, so he's still the best part. Though honestly, I like Norman McDonald's take on Glumshanks a lot. Speaking of voices, they have a lot of weird ones. James Hetfield is Wolfgang, Jason Ritter is Dirk Spyro, Ashley Tisdale is Stealth Elf, and the weirdest one, Jonathan Banks is Eruptor. Put your dick away, Walter. I'm not having sex with you right now, Walter. I was never super into these games, but these really made me nostalgic. Like, I remember this Christmas song, and it goes way harder than it should. This is not a complex show, but sometimes dumb, simple childhood fun is enough. The Cuphead Show. The show overtook the internet for a solid couple months before it just kind of filled it away with no real impact, but that's this image of Mugman pointing. However, I, Stripe the Squid, full legal name, officially declare the Cuphead show is, in fact, pretty funny. Sure, it doesn't emulate the 30 style in humor or animation, but that's fine because it gave us the devil, the gayest thing since your mother, and I love him. King and King Knight is easily the funniest parts of the show. The bros are fun too. Albeit Cuphead can be a little annoying at points. I think the light story they have is pretty fun. Mostly as a way to tie together the main characters, but I don't care if there's more funny devil shenanigans. Yeah, the animation isn't frame by frame like the game, but it's still a very vibrant style that can very properly display how fruity the devil is. Guys, do you want to get your favorite character in this? While the show said it's three seasons, it was all produced as one season, and then Netflix split, and we likely won't get any more. We might have gotten B in right before the checkered flag, but this show is still a knockout. Inside Job. Holy frick, the latest show about all the nonsense my mom keeps sending me on Facebook. Inside Job, very well might be the most split show I've ever seen. If everything does amazingly, it does something else that flounders. Let's get the bad out of the way. The art style is fairly generic and very obviously inspired by Rick and Morty. I love the humor is reference based. Not like they do anything clever with it, it's just saying, here, hey, this thing exists, that's it, that's a joke. And Magic Mike. I hate this thing. I think I realized they were making a really fresh, clever adult cartoon. And they forced every adult cartoon trope into one character. So it's something eat him, Mario. But it's great to this show. For one, Regan and Brett. Regan is a great protagonist. She can balance being very pathetic and being really funny and really sympathetic. She's possibly the best protagonist in adult animation, in my opinion. And Brett's just a nice little himbo. The conspiracy part of the show is great. They hit so many different weird theories and urban legends and take them all in really unique and fun ways. The humor is hit and miss, as, as jokes are actual jokes and not just name dropping pop culture always hit. 
and weirdly, the more emotional bits, like where you can struggle to be noticed by your peers and struggle with your dad, actually really work. I think everything is best shown in the 80s episode. A lot of focus is on the cursed one. Tons of references that are just references, but balanced out by a really interesting premise of the town for us to be stuck in, in one time period for all eternity, and a nice moment for Regan and Brett. Like Cuphead, this also had two seasons that's actually one, but sadly, this ended on a cliffhanger. With how mixed season one was, under season two would have ironed out the kinks, and would have gotten all ten classic. For now, we always theorize on that world, but be happy with the reality that we have. My M3. Jorge Guerrero of El Tire and Book of Life fame is back at it with a really great miniseries about a hero and her companions trying to kill a god. Again, miniseries, so it's it's short, so short of Satan here. The animation is beautiful, like it's nearly cinema quality. It's overall super fun with a whole journey they go on and the gods meet. Yeah, it was good. Keep out with the Age of the Wonder Beasts. I'm admittedly pretty tired of post apocalypse stories, but this one is special because it has frog people. Probably would have been better if it had frog people. Kibo is a very stylistic show, obviously from the same people as Voltron, but this is easily their best looking show. The animation is way more fluid. And the world, man. The world is stunning. Kibo is a really nice new character, who also throw hands when a push comes to shove, similar to someone like Aang. That's the main character type I like. And holy frick, male gay representation? That's legal? And we want to keep up with this show. Haha, <laughs> oh god, I still have 21 more. Epic tale of Captain Underpants. I don't like how consistently good this series is. How do we get a really fun book series, a really fun movie, and a really fun show out of the dumbest premise ever made? It perfectly captures the feelings of the books. It's chaotic, it's lowbrow, but it's clever, and that's what makes it great. That it fully knows what it is and it embraces it with flying colors. We need more shows of like Captain Underpants. We should all strive to be Captain Underpants. Like, though the show is funny, and George and Harold's friendship is great too, but I'm just not going to understand the childlike wonder of the series. I see my underwear every day for you, Krupp. I love you. No matter what, this will be the best series focused around toilet humor. Tales of Arcadia. So this is a series of three different shows that's all part of the same world. Troll Hunters is the first and my personal favorite. It's an admittedly very standard story of a loser kid being ambushed by two giant monsters, being told that he's the chosen one meant to save the world from a group of evil monsters, as ropes his friends into the thing as the world and the world expands. It's a really standard story, but honestly it's rare nowadays to see these kind of simple fun fantasy stories. So honestly, I thought the entire show was charming. All the different monsters they meet are very unique. The dynamic of three have is all fun, and the animation is pretty good for a TV budget. Hubs is produced by Guillermo del Toro and DreamWorks. Tiberlow is probably my least favorite, it's fine, but I don't know, I just don't vibe with the sci-fi stuff as much. At least they take the fantasy stuff in a more interesting direction. This is the most standard sci-fi story of all time, even if I do still like it. And the constant nod to the original. Wizards focus more on the magic and blending of the three shows together. And it's also fun. I think that's the big thing. It's fun. If I ever love 80s and 90s kids shows, they're so into their own world, but it's just so fun that you don't care. These shows really shouldn't blend together well, and that's why they're just so fun. The Dragon Prince. Have you ever felt like you've seen something that should be more popular than it is? Not, oh, I like this, why isn't it more popular? Like, like looking at trends and looking at the actual thing, you wonder, why do more people not talk about this? They really should, logically. Dragon Prince is pretty high on that list for me. It's made by the same team as Avatar. has a very unique look for a CG show. A ton of great characters and a really interesting world and magic system. Yet I've never seen anyone talk about it. Like, it's been going on for six seasons. I never heard anyone bring it up. The show is about a mythical kingdom divided by so much freaking prejudice, man, and two humans and an elf go on a journey to end racism. As I said, this is by the same crew as Avatar. Have they even got Sokka's voice actor as the main character? And the level of charm of that show is carried over. This show is great at balancing humor, drama, and heart. Is it as good as Avatar? God no! But little is. I will say, their seasons aren't bad, but they tend to be a little unfocused. I'm also not a fan of what they're doing with Claudia, originally my favorite character for being a massive dork. Despite being loyal to the main villain, they now made her the actual main villain while removing all the actual personality from her, which really rubs me the wrong way. Still, again, I'm shocked the show isn't more discussed. And maybe one day, we'll make the kingdom whole again. I heart Arlo. Okay, let's just get the easy joke out of the way right now. A spin-off to the Netflix original film Arlo the Alligator, I Heart Arlo is a show that's simply made for me and me alone. Tori comedy about a super nice kid who happens to be a reptile. 
I freaking love reptiles and just the smell of town quirky characters he goes on. I also don't care if it's Marjorie Wood and Fabio 2019. Is there anything else I can say? No! Carol in the universe. To play her as myself, since because no one watched me, so it's fine. Carol in the universe gives us possibly the most depressing answer to the apocalypse. How does everyone react to the end of the world? Simple. They don't. I goes on as usual. As Carol goes to her boring job, interacts with his friends, robs a bank, spends time with the nudist parents. Okay, there's weird stuff, but overall, the show has a really uncomfortable off atmosphere that's floaty, which is the first time in the world that pops in my head, but it's still unsettling. Spoilers, but never actually show the end of the world. It's still a few days off. I like that much better. It really leaves you uneasy. I'm gonna end this with a jump scare. <laughs> Bloody Thunderstruck. Stop motion is a beautiful animation medium. It can be made into so many wonderful creations. Stop motion on TV is at best one episodes, and at worst for about chicken. Other shock comedies that don't realize the cartoon characters having sex and swearing stopped being funny decades ago. Bloody Thunderstruck, made by the same crew as Robot Chicken, realizes what it needs. Soul and a family-friendly series that has the characters being set on fire every episode. Trauma is the main thing here. It's a show about an outlaw who's also a racer, and the dummies he interacts with. The show that I rated and short, so watch it. Yeah. All hail King Julian. Sorry, King Julian. I'll put you back together. I'll make you all again. I said in my Nick video that Pain Madagascar was the best thing to come from the series. I stand by that. But here's something even more controversial. I think the show is the second best in tournament. This takes place before the first movie, showing the ruling ruler's kingdom and the many, many enemies he has to fend off from the crown. I find how funny the series can be, man. Julian is such a goofball, but it like he does have a genuine sense of wanting to be a good ruler. Also, more to Elder's horror, but there's so much more than that, that man. It's a genuinely really funny and pretty well thought out show. So much so that I'll probably make a video on it, most likely covering all the Madagascar media. For now, hands off the feet, keep your eyes on the crown. Scott Pilgrim takes off. Watch a video on anime based on Western media. I am still very lazy. <laughs> Battle Kitty. Netflix has been a lot more experimental than other services when it comes to interactive media. And both their most overlooked and possibly best example is Battle Kitty. This is a very loose show built around video game mechanics. But it turns out to be a genuinely really fun time. So much so that I ended up doing every single choice on my first watch through because I wanted to see it all. I'll show you a lot of, of all things, the 3DS Mii games like Miitopia and Street Pass, and that stranky, jankly, bobbly style works super well for both the fantasy world and the comedy. I really love all these characters, to the point where if there was an option to help a character, I usually would, because I don't want my babies hurt. Again, it's a choose your own adventure story, so I'll cut it there. But no matter what you choose, Battle Kitty is always the correct choice. Battle Kitty! That's the name. The Midnight Gospel. I remember the show being massively hyped up because it's an adult show, Co-developed by Adventure Time creator, Ted Ward. But kind of throws it out in the public space quickly thanks for being very off-color. I loved it though. The show is a framing device where the main character is a reality traveler who goes to different universes to interact with people. These segments are actually real, genuine interviews that the show interprets in the most trippy, creative way. But like the main character is giving birth. That was a choice they made. This is also a setup that has near infinite possibilities. And it's such a unique idea for a show they, of course it was canceled after one season. We can't have nice things. Sucks. But it's a really fun experience that I really recommend listening to and traveling to a whole new world with. <laughs> Delicious in Dungeon. You've certainly heard of this show at this point. Delicious in Dungeon is easily set up to be THE anime of the year. It completely overtook the web. And it's not hard to see why. The series focuses on a group of adventurers trapped deep in a dungeon. But they all have very little food to eat. So to make up for it, they do entire bale grills and just eat the various monsters they find. Something something anime food looks so good. The dishes they all make are also appealing, especially if it being from rats and bugs. And even though most are impossible to make in real life, it's always fun to see them prepare them. The characters are really what carries it. Thelos and Marcel are really enjoyable little scrub clothes in their own right. Essentially the character that grounds the series, while at the same time being as wacky as a cast. Also, I've seen so many people hype up how he's the rare male character to get fan service moments. Yet I've yet to see a single person actually simp for the dude, compared to the 50 uncensored images I see a day of Marshall and Phelan scissoring since no one knows how to censor images on Twitter. It is a Toomey. She is my daughter. She's my precious little bean girl. This show is already shot super high with the anime list. And that's just season one. We already confirmed season two. I'm sure it'll be even better. Mostly because Izzy Toomey are only joining the party right at the end. So we'll definitely have more of my little freaking creature. 
dive in the dungeon and take a bite. Bee and Puppy Cat, Lazy in Space. This is a sequel, kinda, reboot, kinda, of the web series of the same name. I remember really liking this series, so I'm glad this adds on to it while keeping everything that made this show great. It's still the half relaxing, half heartbreaking little show with a kitty voice by Vocaloid. Actually, I was lying. This character was voiced by Wutai Musso in the original series, but he's replaced in this, so this show is garbage! Ah! The first three episodes are recaps of the web series. So while I do recommend the original series, you can watch this without that knowledge. You think just adding 15 more shows to my normal 15 wouldn't matter, but this is so draining, man. Great eggs and ham. You think stretching a book of famous for only using 50 different words to a full series would be a terrible idea? Especially considering the, let's say, 50 track record of series advertisements. This one, though, this is epic. This show is actually the most expensive Western animated series of all time. And you can tell, this brings a book to life more accurately and beautifully than even the big budget film adaptations. And while they of course take liberty to the story, the heart is still there. I wouldn't expect Michael Douglas, of all people, to voice Guy, but his grouchy yet occasionally snarking optimistic voice suits him greatly. And Santa speaks to Steve. The first season, no spoilers, but there's a scene in this cartoon adaptation of Dr. Seuss book that absolutely broke me. The narrator is great too. He gets all the rhymes in, keeping the soul of the book, but while forcing every character to rhyme themselves. Season 2 is definitely nowhere near as strong, but still great. Focusing on the Butter Battle book, I hate the narration, I like the focus more on the characters and Guy's new family. It's got way more heart and soul than a Dr. Seuss adaptation should, and you should try it. Here, there, or anywhere. I only had a random anime fight scene though. Arcane. I don't like hype backlash. It's always lame to see someone say they dislike something, not because of actual quality, but either for its fan base or because people can't shut up about it. The only time recently I've fallen into this mindset though is this. Listen, I live by one rule, and this show challenged it. That rule being that everything that comes from Legal Legends is bad. The show dares to challenge the notion of being an emotional series with a great animation and characters I actually care about. That challenged my feeble mind, and I couldn't handle it. It's been two years since that time. So I've changed and grew as a person, but I don't know what to say about the show and a million others haven't said already. Yeah, it's great and it deserves its praise. Is it Forgive League good? No, of course not. League could cure cancer, so be awful. But uh, season two soon. Go to your Netflix account and watch this show. This video is definitely not sponsored. And John Netflix is not giving millions of dollars to pay them as they're going through one of the most controversial moments. Pluto. My knowledge of Astro Boy is deep. As in I saw that god awful CG movie and nothing else. So maybe I can't appreciate all the complexities of Pluto, but as you can tell from its placement, that's not saying much. This is a much darker take on the Astro Boy series, but not like grim dark. Just exploring the differences in human and robot relationships. The show has a very eerie atmosphere, keeping around every corner. And every single line has weight. Every Keith David jump scare is epic. And overall, it's just a very unique experience. I don't have much to say about it since I covered it in my video on what I watched in 2023. It was a great time. I'd recommend it. I'm not good at ending these things, guys. Six more, six more, six more, six more. Tear along the dotted line. Netflix has earned a reputation for making shows that are goofy on the surface, but easily switch to soul crushing. And Tear along the dotted line might be the biggest example. Every single aspect of this show is so carefully put together. It's all told by the main character, Zero, and his perspective. As he narrates the whole show, it voices every character in it. Besides his armadillo, who's, who's his conscious and above him, the power scaling goes crazy. The world isn't actually full of animals, it's just how he interprets the world. The horrible, depressing way he interprets the world. Unlike the FSR family where the locusts are clearly telegraphed, this show is great at lulling you with a false sense of security before absolutely gutting you. It helps that unlike that show, this one is actually really funny. Or I should mention the sequel, kind of, maybe, This World Can't Tear Me Down. Nowhere near as good, but I said it does sit on a lot of what I liked about this show. So no matter how you tear it, this show crosses the line to be one of my favorites. The Wise Samurai. The next big darling for Netflix, I'm honestly kind of running out of things to say for the entries. Yes, the animation is beautiful. But god, the story is so well thought out. It's taking place in 16th century Japan, Mizu is a half Japanese, half white fugitive in a very anti white Japan, trying to find the four men who wronged her and taking revenge. It's kind of like Milan. Milan was the edgy fan fiction people write about it. But like, good. The show is a very dark take on that. Not grim dark, but again, we have another action western animated series. Again, we're dancing around spoilers. But this show is absolutely worth your time. Sorry, Punk Edge Runners. Watch my video on anime based Western media. Guys, I just love saving time on a 15 page video. She Ra, the Princess of Power. 
Okay, so objectively, there's nowhere near as good as the four weeks below it, but it just means a lot to me. I will explain why in the own video. What I will say now is I'm trapped the best character, and she captured did nothing wrong. We must be strong. Bojack Horseman. So notice we're trailing trade with this show recently. If Bojangle Horsemangles is brought up, it's usually negative. Mostly to bash how pessimistic and depressing Bon Jovi Huntsman is. And yes, Blackjack Hugh Jackman is a very depressing show. Depression and suicide are topics that very rarely discussed in media. And if they are, they are fumbled. This show is one of the very rare times it's done well. Bowser Jr. Housemaid takes very careful time to build up how screwed up Bojack is as a person. Both morally, but also his entire life. A lot of media with bad people as a lead tend to fumble in making them too cool or likable. Bojack constantly remains as a sympathetic, but never someone you actually want to idolize. It's why the show is so hard hitting. This dude's a scumbag, but I care about him. I want him to improve. I keep taking myself every time he makes another boneheaded mistake. But the important thing here is that something those people on social media who've only seen the four out of context scenes don't know. And that's that Bonfire Hacky Sack is the stupidest show of all time. I don't get the people who think the show is just depressing. Some with Todd and Mr. Peanut Butter is some of the funniest, wackiest shenanigans I have ever seen. It is so well thought out. Every joke and random gag tends to get called back in some way. But what makes them, heck, Bojack, Diana, and Princess Carolyn great, is that they are funny, yes. But they're balanced out by being the fleshed out characters. I care about the arcs of all five. I somehow managed to balance out humor and the story perfectly of all five. All of whom get their own unique struggles that really intersect in terms of message. A very shout out to my boy Todd. Obviously the funniest part, but I like that he's a consistent ray of sunshine that prevents the show from being too dark. Always sticking with Bojack. And of course with Ace Discovery, that let me discover that about myself too. Benjamin Horsepower is easily one of the funniest, deepest, and overall greatest shows I've ever seen. It very well might be my favorite adult cartoon. But that's really it. Alright, I'm gonna mention time. <coughs> you know me? Okay, let's have a big mouth. I'm currently researching my video on the worst cartoons. Big Mouth does not qualify based on the rules I set up. I've seen four of the shows that qualify based on my rules. Big Mouth is the worst in all four of them. I've seen people hurl accusations at this show, mostly based on the first trailer, and that's been going on forever. Not really because they've actually seen the show. I have seen the entire show. So let me tell you, it's worse than you can ever imagine. This is easily the most uncomfortable I've ever been watching a show. Every single joke in this show is just kids have sex. Maybe a few unfunny fourth wall jokes, but the grand majority of the show is just them showing body parts of children and having them talk. This is uncensored. I had to look away from the show so many times, it's so freaking uncomfortable, guys. I hate this one. And I will definitely advocate for the show for a little bit. The big complaint I see is the art style. Yes, it's ugly, but it was chosen to be this way to dissuade keepers from drawing NSFW of the characters because the show covers very sensitive topics. I appreciate taking the bullet layer. I wish Japan had thought the same way. That doesn't save it when they literally acknowledge the show qualifies as CP in the first season finale. It's not funny, by the way. It's over 70 episodes, I think I only chuckled like twice. Just chuckled, nothing big. The sad thing is, I think this could work. I think in reality, this could be good. I like the idea of a creature to affect human emotion. The more serious bits with Depression Kitty and Insanity Mosquito, I think are actually really well done. The idea works. It's clever. So much you can do with it. Whether it's a more straightforward educational show trying to explain these topics to kids, or more entertainment take aimed at older audiences, it could work. The problem is the show is made for no one. The jokes and use of nudity are far too expensive for kids, or most teens. But the lessons are irrelevant for adults. So who's this for? The show's creators? If this is what they want, I want to check the fight logs, man. I'm just, I'm just a little curious. Oh, and human resources sucks too. Not the same bad writing, but it's slightly better. This is the last most of the gross human stuff. It focuses on the monster stuff. But it's not completely gone, and it's not funny. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. I might make a video on this show, but that would require watching it, so don't hold your breath. If I do, though, I'll make one promise. Big Mouth will be the one time I will ever fully swear in a video. You have been warned. Hilda. Hilda's my favorite cartoon of all time. I mean, it goes back between this and Gravity Falls, but still, that's not taking anything from this show. This show is very special to me and just in general. The world has a vibe no other has. The hair is just so white and inviting. The creatures are all intricate. Here they're lovable. The story always gripping. All things I will tell us in its own video. Yes, this is a cop out. 
I know it's lame to end this ungodly long video with a stay tuned, but guys, a one minute segment simply isn't enough to even scratch the surface on how much I love this show. Watch, Hilda. There's no funny lead in, just the greatest cartoon I've ever watched. It's hard to be too optimistic about Netflix. They have gotten some good things recently, and those good things do tend to actually get at least a season or two. But as this video has shown, they really don't last long. So many of these shows could be all-time classics if Netflix didn't kill them so quickly. It's sad, because the nature of Netflix makes these inherently so much more varied than any other service. Anime and Western shows together, adult and kid-focused, episodic and serialized. It's hard to say any service beats Netflix in terms of original animation. Even with them constantly pulling the plug, it's a great service. If only they let those shows flourish. Still, it's given me some of my favorite shows, so overall, I think Netflix is pretty cool. And that's another binge wrapped. Uh, I, I think next year will probably be adult cartoons. And hey, with so many adult cartoons I just watched already for this video, I'm sure that binge will be a breeze, right? Me and my big mouth. <clears throat> big mouth. That's the show.